This is the Bentley Flying Spur, and it's a bit like a Mercedes S-Class, except if you buy one of these, people will know you're very rich rather than in someone else's posh airport taxi. In this video, I'm gonna be telling you everything you need to know about this near 200,000 pound luxury limo. So stay with us, and remember, for a great deal on your next new car, just head over to whatcar.com or Google What Car Deals. Now, the Flying Spur name was first used by Bentley back in the 1950s to mark out a fast version of the Continental. These days, it's a model in its own right, although it still shares quite a few components with the Continental GT. That is a two-door coupe, and this fairly obviously is a four-door saloon. This particular car is a Flying Spur S, so it has the black line specification, and that means you get this huge black grille, a black strip on the bonnet, and if you come around to the side here, some fake, black plastic vents on the wing there. You also get a standard part black plot machined alloy, 21 inch alloys. This car doesn't have those though, as you can see, it has the 22 inch optional satin wheels. If you prefer things a little bit more traditional, you can of course have chrome detailing and a chrome grille. You'll just have to avoid the Flying Spur S and go for the regular Flying Spur or the Mulliner or the Azure version. In fact, you can pretty much make your Flying Spur look however you want, although some color combinations are arguably a little bit more tasteful than others, but each to their own. Now these days you're not allowed to have fixed protruding bits of metal on the nose of cars because if you would hit a cyclist or a pedestrian then very bad things are likely to happen. But there's another reason this flying bee here isn't fixed in place and that's that if someone tries to nick it then it will automatically retract into the bonnet and hide itself away. The Flying Spur is currently the largest saloon that Bentley makes after the even bigger Mulsanne was dropped back in 2020. But this is still an absolutely enormous car. It's 5.3 meters long and two meters wide. So it takes up even more road space than a long wheelbase Range Rover. There's a choice of three engines under this enormous bonnet here, and they're all pretty big ones, as you'd probably expect. There's a six litre W12 with 626 brake horsepower, and then there's a four litre V8 with 542 bhp, or there's this 2.9 litre V6. But unlike the V8 and the W12, which run purely on petrol and an awful lot of it, this is actually a plug-in hybrid. So it also has a 134 brake horsepower electric motor to give it combined 536 bhp. The electric motor is fed by an 18 kilowatt hour battery and you charge that up by using a type 2 cable. If you plug in to a regular 7 kilowatt wall box you'll be waiting around three hours to go from empty to full and that is the quickest that the Flying Spur can charge. The plug-in hybrid version of the latest Range Rover that has a CCS charging port so that can go from zero to 80 percent in around an hour and it has a bigger battery than this and a much longer pure electric range. If you do go for the plug-in hybrid version then officially just 75 grams of CO2 will come out of here every kilometer and you'll be averaging 85 mpg. Now those figures are pie in the sky of course and are because of the unrealistic way that the official tests are done but it does mean you'll pay a much lower rate of benefit and kind tax than you would on the V8 or the W12 version. In terms of monthly salary sacrifices, this will cost you about the same as a 96,000 pound Mercedes S500. The Flying Spur range starts at about 170,000 pounds with this S version of the plug-in hybrid costing about 193,000. But that's before you've added any options and this car has rather a lot of those. This Cote de Genève finish on the center console here costs 1,900 pounds. These 22 inch satin alloys, they're almost 4,800. This rotating infotainment screen costs around five grand. And it means you can go from modern to old school at the touch of a button. This sunroof is 2,600. The 6,600 pound touring specification pack adds adaptive cruise control, lane assist, a head-up display for the windscreen and an infrared camera so you can see where you're going better at night. Mood lighting on the inside and on the tread plates down here costs 2,000 pounds. And this range topping 2,200 watt name audio system costs 6,800 pounds. It sounds absolutely brilliant, but if you don't want to spend quite that much on a sound system, there is a cheaper Bang & Olufsen version, or you could just stick with the regular Bentley system. We haven't tried it, but it's pretty safe to assume that it's still better than the system in the vast majority of family hatchbacks. 
So you're probably going to be sitting in the back at least some of the time if you're buying one of these. And as you'd expect, it's an absolutely lovely place to be. The window line is quite high, so it feels a bit like a pillar box in here, but a very luxurious one with lots of leather. And to be honest, you're probably going to have these window blinds up here anyway, so you're not going to be that bothered about the view outside. Headroom is okay, it's not exceptional, slightly better if you avoid this sunroof. But legroom, there's absolutely loads of it. This seat in front is set up for my driving position. I'm just over six feet tall, and look at that. And to be honest, if it's just you and your driver on board, you're going to be sitting on the other side of the car anyway, and then you can slide the front passenger seat all the way forward and enjoy even more knee room. Both of these outer rear seats are heated. They're also ventilated to keep you cool in the summer, and they can even give you a massage. So you're gonna be really, really comfortable back here, especially seeing as there are four air conditioning zones in here. So you can not only have a different temperature to those people sitting in the front, but also to your fellow rear passenger sitting on the other side of the car. The only place you're not going to be that comfortable is if you're sitting in the middle here because the seat base is narrow, it's a set a bit higher up, so headroom isn't great. And you've also got this massive tunnel here in the floor that you need to straddle. So to be honest, you're better off just folding down this chunky armrest here and treating it as a four-seater or just going for the optional four-seat configuration. That does away with the middle seat altogether and gives you two individual armchair-style seats in the back here that are even more comfortable. One thing you do lose a bit of if you go for the plug-in hybrid version though is boot space. There's actually slightly less room for luggage in here than there is in a Volkswagen Golf. And when you consider how big this car is, that's a little bit disappointing, especially as quite a lot of the space is taken up by this massive bag of charging cables. But at least the low bay is very broad right at the back of the car here. So you should fairly easily be able to slot a couple of bags of golf clubs in there. Now, sometimes when you get in a really expensive car, everything looks nice and sparkly. But when you actually start touching it, you realize it's perhaps not that well put together. Thankfully, that isn't the case here at all. This is genuinely one of the nicest interiors in any car on the road, way better than an Audi A8 or a Mercedes S-Class. In terms of the quality of the materials and the way everything's put together, if not necessarily the technology, it even edges the latest BMW 7 Series. Yes, they are much cheaper cars, but if you're paying extra for a Bentley, you want to know that you're getting more than just a badge, and here you absolutely are. Loads of leather on the dashboard here, and metal detailing as well. These indicator stalks are particularly nice. Some metal knurling there, they feel really solid and well damped, and there's some more knurling on the drive mode selector down here. As with the outside of the car, you can have pretty much any color scheme you want in here. This particular car has dark fiddleback eucalyptus and grand piano veneer on its dashboard. There are lots of other wood choices as well, or if you want something a bit more modern sporty, you can have carbon fiber instead. Some people would say that's sacrilegious in a Bentley, but again, each to their own. All versions though come with this 12.3 inch touchscreen infotainment system. It's a bit of a shame that there is no rotary controller down here like there is in a BMW 7 Series or a Rolls-Royce Ghost or even the old Molzan for that matter. But at least the screen is easy to see. It's angled up towards your face. It's nice and bright. It sometimes takes a little while to respond after you've pressed it but it has lots of technology. Apple CarPlay and Android Auto come as standard, and generally the layout is easy to use. Storage is okay, but while you might think there's a big cubby under this armrest here, there actually isn't. It just moves backwards and forwards. It doesn't actually open. There are, however, a couple of cup holders just in front of it here, and there is a tray for your phone down here that has a wireless charging pad on it. And the door bins as well, they're quite small in terms of length, but they're wide enough for a bottle of water or something like that. So all in all, very, very nice in here indeed. Now, if you're thinking this is a plug-in hybrid, so it must be an environmentally friendly choice, then you really need to have a word with yourself because this is a two and a half ton monster that not only has a whacking great V6 petrol engine, but it has an electric motor as powerful as the one in a Renault Zoe and a battery almost as big as the one in an original Nissan Leaf. So if you think about all the resources needed to make this one car, well, you're really not gonna be doing the planet any favors at all. Even if you plug this car in religiously and drive it on electric power as much as you can, it will never break even in terms of its carbon footprint over its lifetime. 
And that's partly because it's not very efficient even when running on electric power because again, of its weight and the fact it's got huge alloys and fat tires. But if you're looking at this purely as a way to save money on tax, then it does make some sense. If you want a flying spur and you're gonna be paying benefit and kind tax on it, then this will save you an absolute fortune compared with the V8 and the W12 petrol versions. If you're running on pure electric power, acceleration is okay. You'll be able to keep up with other traffic easily enough. And the car can actually do 87 miles an hour. So even cruising on the motorway will be absolutely fine. Although if you do that sort of speed, you won't get very far before the petrol engine kicks in. Even according to the official figures, this car has a pure electric range of 25 miles. In the real world, you'll be lucky to get 20 miles and considerably less than that if you're cruising at 70 miles an hour. When the drive battery is flat, then the petrol engine will automatically fire up. And when it does so, you will notice that it's a little bit coarser than you might expect. Now, don't get me wrong, this is not a diesel Volkswagen Passat, but when you consider the price of this car, and it's supposed to be unparalleled levels of luxury, then it's perhaps a little bit disappointing, as is the gearbox as well, actually. It can be a little bit hesitant at times, and it doesn't seem to manage the fact that there is a petrol engine and an electric motor providing the power together. It can sometimes get a little bit confused and it just again, isn't that smooth. This car is very, very quick though. It can do 0 to 60 in around about four seconds. So it's just as rapid as the V8 petrol version. And that is great when you're going a straight line, but when you come to a corner, you are suddenly very aware of how much this car weighs. For starters, the regenerative brakes, they are not that smooth. They can be a bit grabby when they're slowing down as they try to harvest energy to feed back into the battery. And that makes it a little bit difficult to judge how much pressure to apply. And then when you do turn in, you'll find the steering very nicely weighted actually, but the nose of the car only begrudgingly begins to point in the direction you want it to go. So this isn't a car that you could describe as agile, even by luxury saloon standards. And then we come to the ride, which again, given this car's luxury billing, really isn't good enough. It probably isn't helped by the fact this car has optional 22 inch wheels, and it definitely isn't helped by the weight of this hybrid version. But over sharp edge bumps, potholes, the car shimmies around, and you can feel the surface of the road filtering up through the steering column, and you can hear the suspension working away as well. Fortunately, the ride is pretty comfortable on the motorway where there are usually just gentle undulations to deal with. And for that type of driving, we reckon you're best off putting the suspension in its softest comfort mode rather than the default Bentley setting. So overall, the driving experience in this hybrid version is a bit mixed and it's quite a bit better in the lighter V8 version of this car, which also sounds way better. So unless you're planning on running a flying spur as a company car, it's definitely the one we choose. But for lots more information about the Bentley Flying Spur, head over to our website, whatcar.com. And don't forget to hit subscribe for lots more videos like this one. We'll see you next time.